All right, I've started recording, so let's officially get started. How about that? Because it's close enough. Um, somebody else may come in on us. All right, so uh, here's what I'm going to do first of all. I'm going to let you see my ugly face. Here we go. Uh, You're not ugly. There we go. There I am. I'm in my, my, my lair, and I, I'm sitting on a couch in front of a little table. So I'm sitting in a very weird position. So I'm going to look very strange to you. But that's me. All right. And uh, this is uh, DES, what is it? DES 114, Color and Production. And it, it, this is a very important course. I was, I was sort of saying this before. Uh, it's important because you're going to learn some stuff about color that will probably help you uh, from, from, from a production standpoint. I'm going to be focusing primarily on colors that relate to printing. So you'll get courses where you'll be working with uh, colors for the web. Now I'll mention from time to time in passing, I'll mention things about the web as well, but the focus will be on print production related things. And I will also be working you through several different projects that involve print production aspects, which are very important. And I'll, as we go along, you know, I'll go through all those with you. I'm not going to go through them now because it's just not the way that I want to flow this thing, you know. So that's where we're basically going to head. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to shut this off because, I, you know, it, it distracts me to look at myself. So hello, goodbye, here we go. All right. All right, so uh, we have three things that we have to do this week. Actually, there's four things. Uh, one of them is to just write a brief description of yourself, of uh, an introduction, a say hello to everybody, you know, let's get acquainted kind of a thing. Both of you have seen that, correct? Yes. Okay. Have you guys done it yet? Uh, I haven't yet. Okay. So you'll do that and uh, try to do it uh, by Wednesday. Discussion one, color resources, that's the most important one. Uh, I've highlighted, if you take a look, I've got a, a document file where I've copied all this stuff into. I've highlighted initial post due by Wednesday, 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time. I do this because time and time again I have people who get confused or just simply don't want to do it by Wednesday, 59 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, and then are upset when I knock points off for being late. You know, the, the, the truth of the matter is your initial posts are due by Wednesday, 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time. I, I don't mean to be cruel or mean about this, but, you know, we do have certain rules and requirements that we have to face. Listen, guys, just so that you know it, I'm, I'm going to be 65 years old, March, okay? And I am currently taking my master's degree. And, and the worst part about it is when I was 28 years old, I was one class, one course, there were six individual classes in the course, I was one class away from my master's degree in education, and I quit. And I didn't go back in time, and I lost all my accreditation. So now I have to go back from square one, and I'm retaking all of my courses. I got six courses that I have to take for a master's degree, and I'm currently doing it now. So. I, I, I say this to you because I just want you to realize that two things. I want you to realize that education is a lifelong commitment. I mean, you learn stuff as a graphic designer. I've been doing graphic design, believe it or not, since 1971. And I learn things all the time. No matter how much I think I know, there are things that I've forgotten about or things that I haven't used in a very long time. And... Uh, it's not that I forget them so much as I, they're out of my mind for a while and they're sort of like rusty. So, and then there are new things that come up that you learn. You can always learn something. That, that's essentially what I'm trying to say here, okay? So keep that kind of stuff in mind. And, and it's also for you. You know, you're bettering yourself. So anyway, this color resources thing. Um, basically, I have, uh, I have, placed in the announcements here, and I'm going to go into announcements really quickly. I've, I've placed a number of announcements in here. One is just basically a, uh, a welcome. I don't believe I have any links or anything in there. Yeah, right. Let me go back. 
I don't have any links or anything in there. But the next one, uh, has any, have, I mean, I, I know uh, Jason already said that he hadn't looked, but Hope and Princess, did you guys look at any of this stuff yet? Yeah, I did. Okay. I want to point out a few things to you. This one here, very important. Uh, what I did here was I, I made a link to Adobe Color for you. So this should open up. No, it didn't. Okay, this is the wrong one. This is the th color themes panel. This gives you a very brief description of how to import your color from from um, from uh, Adobe uh, Color CC. The reason I put this in here is because I'm having trouble with my applications. Um, for some reason, I've, I'm on a trial basis. I'm trying to get Sean, my associate dean, to help me straighten this out. And I'm having trouble doing it, so I can't demonstrate this. But this will give you a step-by-step. -step. I mean, I can demonstrate it, but it isn't going to work. So I, I'm giving you a step-by-step a, a -step informational look at how you go about doing this. It's right there, OK? And then this is a link to Adobe Color. So without any sweat or strain, you can come right in and, and there is Adobe Color. That's exactly what you're supposed to be writing about this week. How many of you guys, if any, have seen this before? I saw it. Okay. I, have you looked at it and done anything with it? Yeah, I played around with the colors and the shades. And stuff. Okay. Was it very difficult? No. No, no, not very difficult at all. And, uh, and, and so basically, you've got color rules here. You've got analogous. You've got monochromatic. You've got triadic, complementary, compound. You can go with shades, and you can even do custom color. Each one of these things will set these colors. Now, this is analogous. And analogous means that basically you choose a color uh, that are opposite direct opposites of your chosen color. That's what analogous means. Monochromatic means that you are using just one singular color, okay? Uh, triadic is where you have three points, three points of equal distance apart, and so on and so forth. But I'm going to show you something else in a minute. And then you, got, you can come in here and you can explore. What's cool about this is you can go through this and you can type in whatever you want and like, for instance, next week we're going to be working on an assignment which has to do with a company that, that sells kayak trips, kayak adventures, okay? So if I wanted to take a look at colors that might work for, and this is something to think about because you're going to do this next week. Let's say, for instance, you want to find out something about colors that might relate to kayak. You just take the word K-A-Y-A-K, -A -A kayak. Hope I spelled that right, right? And let me get this out of the way and hit enter. Come on. There we go. There. Kayak 2, Kayak Colors. You come up with all these colors that someone, don't know who it is, but somebody came up with these colors that they believed related to Kayak in some way or, or another. So you can now take a look at these colors and you can use the colors uh, in your production. Now, all you have to do really to get these colors, let's say I want to use sea kayaks, number one. All you have to do is click on save, okay? Click on save, and I have to sign in. I'm not going to do this. You click on save. If you're signed in, what will happen is it will open up. It will allow you to put it into a particular um, uh, group, and then you save it, and it will appear in your uh, in your palettes, if you go back to if you go back to um, let's go to where was it? Uh, is Adobe Color? Here we go. If you go back here, your color themes. Now I was able to I was able to open up one in my color themes for InDesign, but for some strange reason I wasn't able to get it to open up in the Illustrator. And it might have something to do with the fact that instead of being in my normal mode, I'm in a thirty or a seven day trial mode of these programs. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but it happened, and I'm straightening it out. So anyway, uh, you'll you'll be able to figure this stuff out. It is not too difficult, and I've given you what you need to do that. And let me go back to my 
announcements. So there, that's in that announcements link link to Adobe Color. Then I put in here my Blackboard availability. You guys know what Blackboard Collaborate is? Anybody go to Blackboard Collaborate ever? I have not used that yet. Okay, so let me explain to you what it is in case you don't know. Basically, Blackboard Collaborate is the student help center, meaning that at any time, day or night, that you're working on a project, you get stuck with something or you want somebody to look at something and give you some advice or a critique, you can go in there and there will always be some graphic instructor not always me because I'm not there all the time. My times, just for your information, are on Wednesday from 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock Mountain Time. So that's Wednesday from 7 to 11 Mountain Time. And on Sunday, uh, Saturdays, I'm sorry, Saturdays from 7 to 12 Mountain Time. So it's important that you know this because you can always count on coming and seeing me at those times and it will always be in your announcements. Okay? Everybody clear on that? Yes, thank yes. you. And then CMYK versus RGB color. This is actually something that you might uh, find very helpful. That actually I, I think this was I think this is a little premature. I think this is something for next week. But you could look at this. This is where we're heading. Let me go back then. I think this is more for next week, but that's all right. You can take a look at it too. And then our learning co wait a minute, maybe I'm wrong. Hold on, let me see here. What did I do here? Where did my one hold on? What happened? Let me see. Give me a minute. My blackboard links to Adobe Color. Something went a bit awry here. How did that happen? Links to, here we go. I missed one. Yeah, this is the one that I wanted to show you. So let me go back. It's this one here. Look, check it out. This is a very important one right here. Links to Adobe. I'm sorry, one right below it. Links to help you within week one discussion. I didn't show you that yet, right? Right. This is very important. I got a bunch of stuff in here for you. The one that I think you probably want to look at first and foremost is this guy right here. Now, what happens in here is the basic color schemes, introduction to color theory, okay? Uh, you have the contents, which are the color wheel, primary, secondary, and tertiary color, warm and cool color, tints, shades, and tones, color harmonies. Hello, listen, this is what you're going to need for your assessment. Color harmonies, basic techniques for creating color schemes, complementary, analogous, triadic, split comp complementary, tetradic or rectangular, and square. Let me just click on split complementary. And what it does basically is it brings me into this area here. And actually, if you scroll up, you can see that you'll, there are all of your color harmonies. So it shows you what a color, a complementary color scheme is. You understand that that black bar that you see there is representative of your, your complementary color scheme. So when you go to work on your assessment, this will give you the information you need to successfully do it. You come down to analogous. There's analogous. What that means essentially is you're taking a primary color and you're using the colors that are just opposite on the color wheel. And that what is known as an analogous color scheme. And you can read all this. It'll give you the, better, it'll give you the details in a much more uh, complete way than I'm just blowing through right now. There's your triadic uh, color scheme. Triadic is essentially what it sounds like. It's a triangle. So what you're doing is you're picking the colors that are triangularly equal to one another. And it can be any of these equal of equal distance triangular uh, on that color scheme. This one is just showing the orange, the green, and the purple. Okay? But you get the general idea. And this will explain to you exactly what that's all about. And then a split complementary. What, what this one is, this is kind of interesting because what this one does basically is it takes a, a color and then it goes to its complement and it splits to either side of the complement. So that basically is giving you a split complementary. 
I'm saying this in a very brief way. If you read this, you'll get a much, much better idea of it than my brief description. And then, of course, rectangular tetradic. What this does basically is it establishes a rectangular shape and gives you the four colors rectangularly opposite to one another. And the same with the square. This is basically a square or um, uh, a square color, uh, color, color scheme where they're opposite in a square relationship. So this gives you all this stuff right here. Very good. And then you can go and look at all this other stuff as well. Plus, I've also got all these other links. Here's, here's color theory. Why, why study color theory? I mean, if you want to go in and read this, it's not that much information. It's, and this, it talks about things like uh, Pantone communicating in color. This is something that we're going to come back to next week because we'll talk about this kind of thing. Color application. I'm giving it to you now. We'll be talking about it again next week. Uh, go back in here. The science of color in non-technical terms. What I like about this particular one is, again, non-technical terms. Nothing aggravates me more than working on something where it's extremely technical. And I just, it kind of blows me right out of the water. Whereas this is a little bit better in that it's not so technical. It tries to talk at you and not down at you. So you'd come in there and check that out if you want. Basic color theory. Here's one that's very basic color theory. This is the, one of the more simpler ones in here, okay? You can look at that as well. So you can see I've, I've actually put together a tremendous amount. Now, this is something that we will revisit next week because we will be working with CMYK Color. Next week, we will be producing a uh, trifold brochure, and I believe, oh, no, wait a minute. Next week is the poster. Is it? Yeah, next week's the poster. I'm sorry. Next week's the poster and a logo. All right, so we, but we will still be working with CMYK next week. So we will be back revisiting this next week. But I'm putting these links in here now so that you actually have them and you can go in and take a look at them anytime you have the opportunity to. They're all extremely good links and they're all very valuable. Color wheel, again, here's, here's a color wheel and another description of the color wheel. If you want, you can come in. It talks about monochromatic, monochromatic color. This gives you a slightly different um, spin on it. So, again, think about it. Use it. Look at it. It's, it's all up to you. Basic color schemes here, the basic color schemes. Well, that's actually a duplicate of the one that we were just looking at. And then color basics, let's see what one that is. Color basics is, okay, so we already looked at that one. All right, so basically you've got a number of really good links in here that you can use to help you with your um, discussion next week and your assignments next week. And the color wheel, go back to the color wheel for one second. The color wheel is, is a perfect example of what you're going to try to create. So what I generally do, or what I did, was I simply grabbed that image and I dragged that image to my desktop. And that's my model. That's what I modeled my color wheel on. And the reason I did that is because these colors are very specific colors. So what I did was I dragged this over as a model, and then I recreated this as my own color wheel. And I was able to, in Adobe Illustrator, very quickly pick up my colors. And they would be very accurate colors because Adobe Illustrator has great capabilities to go in and grab color data. And I'll show you how to do that. So I'm, I'm just suggesting things to you because you're going to be doing these same projects. And I'm trying to give you an idea as how I would handle it. Because, again, just so that you know, I'm your instructor. I have to come in here and I have to show you how to do things. I have to do these things just like you. So I have to use my own thinking and my own ways of getting this thing done effectively and quickly. So while I'm at doing these things, I try to explain some of this to you, hoping that it will help you. Are there any questions so far about this? Any comments? Any thoughts? Anything? We're all good? No questions yet, anyway. Okay. All right. And then finally, let's go back to announcements one more time. We also have, uh, yeah, we also have a learning coach. A learning coach is essentially an assistant to me. She is somebody that, uh, her name is Wanda Bryan. I'm very familiar with her. And she's showing you her available time. She, she's capable in English Writing Lab, CS 
S101 and graphic arts. So basically, for our purposes, we would be concerned with her in regard to graphic, gra graphic arts. Her availability times are 5 to 9 p.m., uh, 12 to 4 p.m. And of course, I'm, I'm, she doesn't have it down there, but oh yeah, no, all times are mountain time. I'm sorry, there you go. So there you go. And then there's her email right there, a Skype number for her, and her phone number. So again, if you for some reason are not able to get in touch with me, you can also try reaching out to Wanda. That's the second thing. And those are her, that's her timing. And then thirdly, don't forget, there's Blackboard Collaborate. And you'll, you, you can go back to my uh, announcement and see what my times are. But there will always be, anytime you go into Blackboard Collaborate, there will always be somebody there from graphic design, graphic arts, that will help you. All right? So please keep all that in mind. All right, so that's good. So let's get back to this. So what you're going to do is you're going to go in and you're going to check out Adobe Color CC, right? Everybody understand that? And I want you to basically look it over. And what is it telling you? It wants you to do here. Some of you, you'll be able to research. There's also a directly check out Linda.com to enjoy. It doesn't tell you to do anything. <laughs> Assignment. You're supposed to write, I guess what you're supposed to do is write your, it doesn't say, I mean, it's funny that they, I copied this right out. Of, let me go back to the, go back into here, because it's actually very strange that they don't have that broken out as to what they want you to do. It's bizarre. Let's see, color resources, here we go. Let's see, did I miss something? No, I did not. This is graded. What are they grading you on, though? See, that's the thing. Enjoy the research. You have to write you have to write something. So I guess, see, I wrote something. I found the site to be interesting. Okay, so there you go. You did write something. That's what I want you to do. I want you to go in, and I want you to write something about your feelings for this color resource that's been uh, laid out for you. Okay? So guys, got that? You got any questions about that at all? Not really. Okay. You know that it's due by Wednesday. 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time. If it's later than that, I just will have to deduct 20 points. 20% 20 I think is what they knock off if it's late. So you guys understand that? All right, and that, let's move on real quickly to the assignment, the color wheel, and the exploration. All right, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to do, develop a color wheel. So we got a color wheel here. This is the color wheel that I stole from the site. There it is. And what we're going to do is we're going to create one. I'm going to actually show you two ways that you can do this. You can be creative. You could try to do it another way if you want, but it has to end up being a color wheel that, that does the same job as this. You can try to do it in a different way. I'll show you another way that I can do it. I'm going to show you two very interesting ways to handle this. And again, I don't have a problem with you generating a color wheel that looks like this, provided you create it. I'm going to show you how to go about doing it. So I'm going to expect that you create it. I don't want you to just grab this from the site, put it on a, 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 in, in an Illustrator uh, file and, and save it to me as a PDF and send it. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to create this. So I know that may seem ridiculous to say that, but believe me, there have been times when people have actually tried to do these things. So I just point that out to you. And I'm going to demonstrate in a minute how you could go about doing this, and hopefully it will be very helpful for you when you go to try to do it on your own, which is really what I try to do any way I can to make this as easy as possible. That's why I'm saying maybe the first thing to do is to go in there and grab this image. So now you've got the accurate colors that you can use to generate the colors for your color wheel. Okay, all right, so um, the color wheel. Create a color wheel with 12 basic primary colors, secondary and tertiary colors. And then you're going to duplicate it three times. So you will have four artboards or layers. All right, now when it's say four artboards or layers, the illustrator has the ability to make artboards. You guys know that, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, so what you really, forget this layer nonsense, because that's nonsense. You don't want this to be a layers thing, because it's just, it's, it would not be any good. Make four artboards. 
And what you're going to do is you're going to create your, you're going to start off by creating your first um, color wheel, which shows all 12 colors. Okay? Then you're going to copy it and paste it onto the other three boards. And what you're going to do is you're going to show me in the four of them complementary, triadic, analogous, and split complementary. So, if you remember, go back to my announcements, I gave you links where you can go in and you can physically take a look at what those particular um, color arrangements are, and you can see, and it will be very easy for you to do this. You only have to show one color combo in each wheel. So, in other words, I don't want you to try to put more than one color arrangement in, in one wheel. Each wheel, there's four of them, will have one will have complementary, one will have triadic, one will have analogous, and one will have split complementary. Does that make sense to you guys clear with this? Um, yes, but do we use lines to show it? You can use whatever creative mechanism that you want, as long as you use good typography and adhere to the principles of design. This is completely creative on your part. You can use a color wheel just like this, or you can use something different. It's up to you, but it has to work like a color wheel. If it does not work like a color wheel, I will tell you, and I'm not trying to be cruel, but the, the, res the responsibility is to think creatively about this and come up with something that looks like a legitimate color wheel. And then, of course, you're going to show the complementary tri uh, triadic analogous and split complementary. There's a multitude of ways that you could accomplish this and it's totally up to you. I'm, I'm leaving it as open-ended as I can possibly be. I want you to have some fun with it um, and use good typography and adhere to the principles of design. That's the only thing that I am really concerned about is that you use good typography, good sense of typographic, um, and you have good principles of design. Now, you guys know what the principles of design are, right? You guys have all had them in other courses. They've talked about them. Anybody not know what they are? You guys are familiar with CRAP? Contrast, yes. repetition, alignment, and proximity. Have they talked to you about them yet? Yes, they have. Okay. If you have any questions about that, come and see me tomorrow night or look online for the graphic design crap principles. Do a Google search, and it will come up, and it will give you endless explanations of what it is, and you will then know very clearly what that is, okay? So you shouldn't have any trouble with it. Illustrator is the easiest program to do this assignment in. I'm going to go a step further. Please do it in Adobe Illustrator. This is not just the easiest program to do, but for a piece of art like that, Believe me when I tell you, as a graphic designer who has done this kind of work for many, many years, you have to start learning to work with the right programs, doing the right things in those programs. And doing a piece of art like this is correctly done in a program like Adobe Illustrator. This is essentially a piece of vector art and it should be done in Adobe Illustrator. So I'm going to ask you kindly to do this in Adobe Illustrator because it is the right way to do it. And believe me, we are in a color and production course. So I wouldn't be much of an instructor if I didn't try to teach you things about production that makes sense. And whenever you're working on any sort of vector art, this is something that you're going to have to learn. You might as well start learning it now. There is raster art or bitmap art, and that gets modified or edited in Photoshop. There is vector art, and that is, or um, uh, raster art, vector art. Ra vector art, or what's another name for it? Well, vector, or vector art will do. Vector art is uh, art, line art that you work in Adobe Illustrator. So you really do need to know the difference and that that there are certain programs that you use for certain things. When you're working with vector program or vector art like this, you're going to be working in Adobe Illustrator. So do that. 
And uh, it also tells you to work in InDesign, but it really does not make any sense to do this in Adobe InDesign. It just doesn't. And, and I, would not I would not even recommend that you do that. So for your own good, not for my good, okay? For your own good, learn the right way. Learn to use the tools the right way. When you're working on something like this, the right tool is to work in Adobe Illustrator, not Photoshop, not InDesign, Illustrator. Learn from the beginning to use the tools the right way. And then of course you're going to submit this as a multi-page PDF which you shouldn't have any trouble doing if you're doing an Adobe Illustrator because uh, Adobe Illustrator if you have four individual pages it will automatically save that PDF as four pages. You guys know that right? Have you ever done that before multi-page PDFs from Illustrator? Have you ever done it? I have yes. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. You don't you don't have to do anything special. You just have to set the pages up. You have to have the artwork on the pages, save it as a PDF and it will automatically output that as a multi-page PDF with whatever number of um artboards you have created. Um Lori, is that what your name is, Lori? Is she there? Princess, you're there, right? You can hear me, right? Yes, I can, and she said yes, she can hear you. Oh, okay. She's there. okay, so are you guys good with this? you have any questions about this? I'm going to demonstrate this momentarily, but you guys are cl clear on this? Any questions at all or anything you want to ask me for clarification on? No? Moving on. All right, assessment one, color exploration part two. What you're going to do here is you're going to come up with an abstract geometric composition. Now, let me explain to you what I did. Uh, are any of you familiar with uh, Pennsylvania? Any of you have ever heard? Yeah, you've heard of Pennsylvania. Have, you ever, have any of you ever been to Pennsylvania or close to Pennsylvania? No? no I have not. Okay. If you go to Pennsylvania, one of the things that you see all the place, there's a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch country in Pennsylvania. There's also some in Ohio and a couple of other states. But one of the things that you see all the time are these hex symbols that they put up on the side of barns. And they usually are very simple graphic shapes, geometric graphic shapes, compositions, if you will. And they usually are made up of primary colors. So what I decided to do with my color exploration, and I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to fool around with it a little bit in a little while so that you get a sense of how to go about doing that. I used one of these hex symbols to create my compositions. So all it's telling you to do is to be creative with this. You're going to be coming up with an abstract composition of three different colors, all right? They're actually, you're going to be using analogous for one, complementary for one, and monochrome for one, okay? And of course, you know, you'll ha end up with, I guess you'll end up with three different abstract geometric compositions if you do this, do this correctly, all right? Uh, keep it abstract. Don't bother to try to make a scene. It's non-representational art. So be creative, be abstract. I did something that um, it did not make a scene. It is abstract art or is conceptual art, what I did this thing. You'll see it. And then, of course, Program Illustrator is best, but InDesign can be used. Again, ignore that. Try to learn to do this the right way. When, when, let, me, let me be very specific about this. There are three programs that we are concerning ourselves with in this course. There's Illustrator, there's Photoshop, and there's InDesign. You will be working a little bit in each one of them before we're done in this course. And it will not be very difficult, and I will explain it very carefully and very thoroughly to you so you won't, won't really have any problems with any of it. Right now, all I'm doing is giving you a high-level overview of what is what. So again, there's three different types of art that you can create. There is what's known as vector art. Vector art is essentially lines and anchor points, and it's what you get when you create art in Adobe Illustrator. So both of the assignments that we are going over tonight are best done in Adobe Illustrator because they are basically created around vector art. So what I want to do is I want to recommend that for your benefit, you not only 
uh, do this to learn more about Illustrator, get a better insight into the program, because it is a very important program. But as a graphic designer, I want you to learn the right way to do things. I don't want you to leave my class knowing things that are not incorrect. I'm going to do the very best I can to give you the right information for everything that you that is covered in this course. And that is part of it. Now, Photoshop, that's a raster um, or a, a bitmap editing program. And essentially what that means is, is that you're working with little dots or spots or grids of color and you're modifying these little grids of color. And you don't really do that in Adobe Illustrator. Adobe Illustrator, using with, you're using to create shapes of color using anchor points and line segments. So they're totally different pieces of art. And the, I'm, we're going to talk, each week I'll talk more and more complex about this. I'm talking very basically about this right now. That leaves us with one uh, other program, and that's Adobe InDesign. Adobe InDesign is kind of like a crossover program. Really what it is, it's, it's what's known as a layout program. If you're going to create a business card or a brochure or a flyer, a newsletter, anything like that, you basically create it in that program. You create elements for importing into a layout in InDesign in programs like Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. For instance, you're going to create tomorrow, or next week you're going to create a logo. You're going to actually color a logo. The logo is created. You're just going to work on creating color for it. But you're going to modify a logo and you're going to create this logo for a poster that you're going to make. Now that poster is going to be made in Adobe InDesign. You're going to import elements into that poster from Illustrator, which would be your logo that you're going to create. And I'll show you how to do that. And then what you're going to do is you're going to get a series of photographs. And those photographs, you're going to modify them. I'm not going to get into deep detail about it because it's next week. But I'm just trying to give you an overview of where we're heading. So you got these photographs. You're going to modify Then you're going to bring them into Adobe InDesign. Once you get the pictures in and once you get the logo in, you're going to compose the whole thing into a poster using the layout program. So does that kind of make sense to you? You understand where I'm going with this? There are three specific programs. Each one has its own unique job. And I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of that and that you begin to use these programs the proper way. Any questions? Are we all good? Yes, we're all good. Cool. All right. and. Um, so the size of these things would be eight by eight. Submit multi-page. So again, what you're going to do is you're going to create a three-page, a uh, three artboard uh, in uh, Illustrator file, and then you're going to export it as a PDF. Uh, I'll do that tonight before we get done. All right. So that's that. I got through it. That. All right. Let's go in. Let me go in now. Oh, that's the wrong button. Let me close this thing. I don't think I need this again. I actually, just minimize it. There we go. So here we go. Let's go into Adobe Illustrator. All right. So this is basically this is basically what you guys are going to work on. Have any of you yet? You've none of you have really started this yet, right? Anybody started this yet? I haven't. No. Okay. Good. All right. So let me explain a few things. Let me start off by explaining a few things. So, see over here on my desktop, that little piece of art I grabbed. See what I'm spinning around, everybody? Yes, I do. Okay, so that little piece of art, what I essentially did was I took this thing and I dragged it in, and now I have it in my program. This is how I started this whole thing, okay? So I'm going to size it because it's a little bit too big. Let me just make it a little bit smaller because I'm not really going to use it. I'm just bringing it in as a reference. So now I got this little, I got this little, um, I got this little sample in here, and I don't know whether you can really notice this or not. I think it's pretty obvious. My, my pieces of art, I got one piece of art right here and one piece of art right there. You notice how exactly similar that those colors are to the piece that I dragged in there? I mean, you guys can clearly see that, right? I mean, this, this, yeah. almost, this almost looks like that piece, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The reason it looks that close is because I used basically that tool right there, the eyedropper tool, to sample each one. If I click on this, okay, if I click on it 
double click on. Let's see if I can get it. Here we go. I can change it. I can go with point sample, three by three average, or five by five average. Do you know what that means, right? That means that I can choose to select an area of five by five pixels and give me a color from that. Or I can choose an area of three by three pixels and give me a color based on that. Or I can just go in and I can click wherever my little pointer hits, whatever's there, point sample, going to give me that color. In this case, because the color is even, I just chose point sample. Hit OK. So now anytime I go in here and I drag, like I select something, I don't know whether I got anything ready to go. Yeah, I do. Let me, let me come in here and click on this. Let me click on that. Okay, so you see I got that little color clicked right there? Can you see it's highlighted, it's selected? Mm -hmm. If I come over here at my eyedropper tool, and if I click on that purple color, you see what it did? It changed it to that purple color. That's really all I did to get my colors. Now, the other thing that I did was this. I came in here, and you see how I... Let me hit cancel. You see how I got my purple color in, in my fill? I double clicked on this and right down here I have my colors. Six three uh, six four three zero nine zero. That's my violet. I, I, I actually it's giving me a different number than what I have over here. But what I did was I actually came in here and I grabbed all these colors and I put them up there. So that's where I got all those colors from. This is my color picker. And in here, I have hue, saturation, and brightness. I have RGB, which stands for red, green, and blue. I don't know whether you know what RGB is used for, but it is primarily used for web work. When you're working with uh, artwork for the web, you use RGB. And um, CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, that's what you use for process printing. Now, let me ask you this. How, have any of you had anyone talk to you about this before, or did you know about this in advance? Is this new to you? I've had a couple of instructors touch on it a little bit. Okay, so what's going to happen basically is as you move through this course, we'll talk about this more, and as you move through other courses, other instructors will talk about this more. But since this is a color course, I just wanted to bring up the color picker so that I could go over this a little bit. This also is a hexadecimal number. The hexadecimal number relates to the web. So you've got the RGB, which means that this is 100% red. The green is 48%, 48% green, uh, and that's a value, 48% of a full-on green. And this is a B of 144% green uh, blue. So that gives you that purpley color. All right. Now, the other one here is hue, saturation, and brightness. Now, what is hue, saturation, and brightness? Well, if you take a look over here, okay, and if you look over here, you can see exactly what hue, saturation, and brightness is. Hue is this guy right here. It's a slider. And as you, I want you to take a look at hue. It's set right now to 272. See it? As I drag this down, you see what it's doing? It's changing the number on the hue. You see it? Each one of these colors that you see represented up here is a, a different hue variation that's on that slider. So that's hue. Hue means color. OK? Then there's saturation. This one here. Notice that as I go across like this, you see which one is actually moving the most? The saturation. What does saturation mean? That right there, let me bring it up a little bit. That right there is a fully saturated color. Okay, that means it's full-on color. As I move across it horizontally, you'll notice that it is desaturating, meaning it's getting lighter and lighter. See, as I move back, see it gets darker? And as I move this way, it's desaturating until I go to all white. If I go far enough over here, I'll go all white. Actually, to go to all white, I have to go all the way up to there to get all white. But if I go over to here, I'm to a very low level of gray is what it is. Actually, it's, it's telling me zero. But that doesn't look completely white to me. That looks a slight bit gray. So the only place you're going to find a true white is up in that upper corner right there. See the difference, guys? 
when I drag it over to there, see that's a little gray? Because there's also, you got to consider there's also brightness. This is brightness. Right there is full on bright. And I'm going with the, this, I can do the same thing over here if I want. But I'm over here because I, I think this is easier for you to understand. This is full on bright. And as I go down, look at the number change. It's the B that changes. It's getting darker and darker and darker and darker until it's absolute loss of brightness or uh, black. Okay? So that's what these are. This is basically your hue. And this is your saturation. And that is your brightness. That's how you work with that. And then, of course, RGB, those are numeric numbers that you will use. There's, there's other ways uh, using the um, uh, color panels and the, and the um, libraries of color, which we're going to get into later on. But I just wanted to give you uh, a basic look at this because this is the most basic thing, the most basic tool that you're going to work with is this guy right here. The other thing that I do all the time is I use my eyedropper tool to grab samples. Let me hit cancel. Are you clear on this? Any questions you want to ask about this? So do you just want the, na the name of the color and the code? I'm sorry. What do you mean? Like what you have for the 12 hues? No, I only did. I did that. You don't have to do that. I only did that. I was only explaining to you how I did it. I basically used this thing here as a model. And then what I did was I picked up each color and I grabbed the hue from in here. That's the hexadecimal number. See, that's a hexadecimal number. That's a hexadecimal number. And I, and I called my color red, red, orange, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, yellow, green, green, blue, green, blue, blue, violet, violet, and red, violet. Because that's what those colors are actually referred to. And then I just gave a number for it. Now, if I were to take that number, if I were to select that, let me hit cancel. Let's see if I can do this. If I select that number, let me get that number. Right here. It's a little hard to grab. All right, I got it. All right, now that's red violet. If I go copy it, let's go edit copy, copy. If I double click on this, and if I select that, control V to paste it in, and then if I move to another, there, you see what it did? Red violet. You see what it did? And that color is damn close to that color right there. You see what I'm talking about? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. You know what I'm doing? I, I, basically, I basically use this to generate those numbers the way I kind of – I did it re – I reverse engineered it. In other words, I took the color from here, put it into there to show you that that's the color. How I did that originally, though, was I originally selected this color here. Okay, now it's going to come out slightly different because it always does. But if I click on this, I see that color right there? That's basically that color. If I double click on it, it's telling me it's C31A7B, C21A7D, B. So it's actually just a touch off at C2 instead, instead of C3. So that's not really bad. You get the general idea, though, what I'm doing? Only reason I'm doing this is because I'm trying to teach you a little bit about how to think and look for color and how to utilize tools like your color picker more effectively. Knowing what the color picker is supposed to do. There's more we're going to cover on this, but hue, saturation, and brightness is one of the more important things. And it kind of relates a little bit to what you're going to to see when you get up into Adobe Color CC because they have slider a slider system up there. Uh, it's not exactly like this, but it works along the same lines. Yeah, you'll see when you get in there. Okay. Any questions? Are you good? Um, how big do you have? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. How big do you have to make the color wheel? Um, well, let's. Uh, I, they, there's a size. Let me see what size do they tell you to make it here. Hold on a minute here. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, we want, I uh, don't want this stuff. Was it eight and a half by 11? I said, I don't remember. That's why I'm going back. Cause I don't remember the size off the, uh, the right here. Come on. says 10 by 11. All right. Let's see here. Um, yeah, 10 by 11. It's not, that's the size, that's the size of the document. You, you can put it, you can make it any, any, any size that fits within 10, uh, 10 to 11 comfortably. 
Okay, so, and do you want us to put the, the text it in the color wheel or just as your example, like off to the side? You can, from a design standpoint, you can create your own way of doing it, okay? I actually, let me do this. I think I actually, I got one more. Here's my hex symbol. Give me one second. Let me open something here. Uh, color wheel two, I think that's it. Is that maybe one I got out. Color wheel one, yeah, I think it's color wheel two. Let me see. Yeah, now you see how I did that one? I right. We have that one there. Now if I go back to color wheel one, I have complementary. I got that in the middle. Okay, so okay. You, you can do it however you want to do it. I mean, it's kind of up to you. Uh, okay. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to stifle your creativity. All right, and, and again, you don't, do you have to make this thing circular? No, not necessarily, but I mean, you should probably try to think circular because it, it is a wheel and it will be a lot easier. I mean, you're going to find yourself running into more trouble if you try to go too creative with this and make some kind of weird shape. Because what you have to do is you have to make 12 individual uh, packets, so to speak, or, or, or 12 sections. Right. And that's a, a very important thing, okay? And are you going to show us how to put the color into each of those sections because in the past I, I haven't been on illustrator um, I'm going to so show you I'm going to show you I'm going to show you the whole the whole enchilada in right now I've got illustrator 2017 it just um, updated today is that okay why wouldn't it be well it it said that I should make sure I'm on the same program as my ah, no, that's nonsense let me tell you okay. something let me okay. tell you something. I, I probably built this thing two, two versions back. I've had this for a very long time. This is one of my standard uh, uh, pieces, and I've done this a, a number of times. So, uh, yeah, I, it, don't worry about that so okay, much. Okay, great. Thank you, you. you. Okay, yeah, 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 absolutely fine. Um, all right, so let me go to the view menu first, and let's go to guides, and let's go show guides. Okay, so here's the first thing. So here's basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I created this, and I'm going to show you how I created this, which is that right there, okay? Uh, this will give you some idea how I did this, and even a little bit more of an idea how I did this one. And then this one here, this ought to give you a slight idea of how I did this one. Do you know the whole, do you know the whole story yet, though? No, you do not. But guess what? That's what we're here to learn right now. So every single one of you know how to make a basic shape like that, correct? You know how to make a basic circular shape? Yeah. Yes. I okay. So, as far right. as it goes with me. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, we're going to take this one step at a time. So what I did was I set out a series of guides. The reason I set these guides out is I wanted the center point, and I wanted the center point. So, and you don't have to do two. You only have to do one. So I, but I'm going to show you how to make this one, and I'm going to show you how to make this one. So I need two center points. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Because if you click on this, click on that shape, you see how I get a registration of a center point there? Exactly. All right. I need to know where that center point is. It's the same thing with this. Right. I click that. You don't see it because there's lines over it, but there's a center point that shows in there. I need right. that center point to help me orientate, orient myself as I do this project. So you're going to create, you're going to create a couple of guides. They'll be locked, okay? Lock the guides. And then you're going to create a circle, however big you want that circle to be. And you're going to place that circle so that the center point, look, hits right in the middle, right like that, right in the middle of that intersection of the horizontal and vertical line, you'll do the same thing with this object right here. I'm going to move this object out of the way for now because I'm going to redo do that one in a minute. We're going to work on this one first. So you're good with that? You understand what we're doing so far? Yes, yes. I do. Thank you. All right. So you'll create yourself a circle. You'll make sure that the center point is right dead in the middle, just like you see right there. Next thing you're going to do is you're going to come over here, and you're going to get the line segment tool. Really simple stuff. This is all easy stuff. You're going to come over here and you're going to sit yourself on that guide, the vertical guide, about, oh, I don't know, like an eighth of an inch beyond the circle. You see where I am? I got my mouse held down, so I'm holding it in place. I'm going to hold the shift key down. 
The reason I'm holding the shift key down is I want this line to automatically go straight without any uh, issues. So I'm going to just go straight down until I go outside the circle on the other side, and I'm going to let go. Now, I should have a stroke of one point on it. If I deselect it, the guide is hiding it. So what I'll do is so that you can see it, I'll make it a two-point stroke. There, you can see it now, right? See what I did? Yeah. Okay, so you have no trouble understanding or doing that, right? You can see it's nice and straight right down the middle of my circle, isn't it? Right. Okay. Now the fun part comes in. See what I got sitting right there? Is that the 30 degree? That's exactly what that says. What I, I've done this so many times that I spent time to figure out exactly what the correct angle would be in order to get me 12 segments. And it turns out, and this is why I'm making a big fuss over this, because you should, if you, I hope you have something to make notes on, you should write down that you want this thing to be rotated 30 degrees. And I will show you how to rotate it in a moment. Are you, you with me so far? Yeah, I, I did this in college, uh, vet school actually, in about, oh, when I was 18, and I'm almost 43, so. Okay. Well, you're going to do it again right now, and I have it recorded, and it's easy. It's fun. I really enjoyed this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, I'm not going to select my circle. I'm just going to select my, my vertical rule, right? Okay. And then I'm going to come over to my rotate tool right here and double click it. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to 30 degrees, not zero, 30. Okay? Yeah. And then I'm going to hit copy. Here's the thing. Oh. I'm going to duplicate this rule all the way around my circle by copying it. So the two things that you're going to do is this is going to be selected. You're going to set the angle to 30 degrees. You're going to hit copy, and there you see I've made my first segment. Right, at 30 degrees. So you just wanted to keep... That's double. all I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep doing that okay. once again. And see how easy this is? Yeah. A monkey could do this. A monkey is yeah. doing this. When I start doing it. <laughs> look, 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 one more, one more. Look, watch. Look at that. Okay. See that? And now I've got equal, I've got 12 exactly equal segments. There, there's no variation on them. They're perfect. All right, so now we're going to have some more fun. I want to turn this thing into a donut. So what do I want to do with this? I want to now click on the circle, and I want to go edit copy, edit paste in place. So what I did was I copied the circle, and I placed it exactly where it was over top of its original. So there's actually two there. Does that, you guys got that? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I'm going to now come over here, and I'm going to, I could do this one of two ways. I could either use the scale tool. If I had a number, I could use the scale tool. I like to just use the free transform tool, a regular old free transform tool. And then what I like to do is I like to click on my corner point right here and hold down the shift key and the alt key. Now what the shift or option key if you're on a Mac, option or alt, shift, and what that will do is that will essentially allow me to constrain it so that it's going to reduce in a circle, but it's going to reduce from the circle out or in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now just bring it in. You see it? See what it's doing? Yeah. It's bringing it in towards the middle. And when I get it where I want it, I think tonight that'll be good. I now have all the elements that I need to make my pie. Okay. That's easy, right? Makes sense. All right. So I'll go to the view menu. And I'm going to go to guides. Hide the guides for a moment. There it is. Look at that. It's already. It's there. So now what I want to do is I want to chop this thing all up. I want to make this thing into a bunch of segments that looks like that. Right. Very easy. I'm going to marquee. You guys know what a marquee is, right? You select everything by marqueeing it. You drag, you click off of it, and drag over all of the elements. Let go, and they all select. That's called a marquee selection. 
You guys got that? Never done that before. Yep. Yeah. Click and drag over top of everything. Don't drag over anything other than what you want. Just drag over all the elements that you want, okay. and it selects them all. It's called a marquee selection. Okay. I'm going to come up to the window menu. I think I might have it out here, but let me check. Window menu, and I'm going to open up Pathfinder. Where are you? Right there. Pathfinder. Okay. Now, the Pathfinder has different shape modes. This one here will unite all the objects together. It's not what I want. This one here will make a minus front. It will, re it will remove whatever's in front of another object, essentially punching a hole in it. That is close to what I want, but not exactly. Then this is intersect. It creates a, a selection that shows the intersection of the objects. And this is an exclusion, which is, does the exact opposite of an intersection. Then you have these guys down here called the divide, the trim, the merge, the crop, the outline, and the minus back. The one that I want, I want this one, which is called divide. What that is going to do is it's going to divide all this stuff up, making all different pieces, like cutting a pizza. So I'm going to click on that. Watch what happens when I click on it. The lines go away. And what you end up with is you end up with essentially this whole thing divided into pieces that I can select. See, now I got to go object ungroup because it's, it ends up being grouped. But now that it's ungrouped, can you see how I can just select that one little section right there? Right, okay, so object ungroup. Yep. Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to come into the middle here and I'm going to again marquee through the middle. And you see how that whole center area gets selected by marqueeing it? I marquee, I come into that segment right there. And I click and I drag a marquee across the entire center of it. I don't touch any of these outside ones. Did you see how I did that? Yeah. And I hit delete or backspace. And what do I got? Perfect pie, don't I? Right, yep. Now all I got to do is come in here and click on this, get my eyedropper tool, and click on, well, I, mine is a little rotated, so I have to be a little careful with this. There's my red. It's, what it's doing it's, it's, it's duplicating whatever it's over. It's putting it into that piece. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click the next one, get my eyedropper tool, and click on the next one, which is the purple. And I'm just going to go all around my, I'm going to go all around my uh, pie. I'm going to select all of my pieces, and I'm just going to be very careful to make sure I click the right color. Right. Each time I go around this thing, and in a few moments, I will have basically duplicated. Yes, that's the right color. I sometimes mess this up because I'm not the brightest bulb on the midway here. Should we leave our sample up there? Huh? Should we leave our sample up there, like the one that you... Uh, you can if you want. It doesn't hurt anything. No. Okay. Just that's fine. Yeah, it's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. And I'm just gonna. I don't. I'm just doing this to make sure that you have under. You have no problems with any part of what I'm doing here. Uh, any questions about this? Not yet. Mm -hmm. so far. It seems simple. Because I got another fun one in a minute. I'll show you as soon as I get these things done. I'm gonna go to this guy right here. Yeah. I. I'm, I might as well do all of them just for the sake of it. Because I'm only. I'm only a couple away from being done. So I go to that dark blue. And then I click on uh, this guy here, and that is the purple right there, right? And then the last one right there, and that is that guy right there. Boom. There we go. And now I have my color wheel, and my color wheel looks exactly like that color wheel, doesn't it? Except it's slightly rotated a little bit, right? Pretty good, huh? What do you think, guys? You think you could do that? I'm hoping so. Well, does it seem so too. I think I can. Any anything you want to ask me about it? Uh, I I never have questions during the live sessions, but I have a million when I go to do it. Tomorrow night, I'm here from seven o'clock to nine o'clock, multi session. You can come in tomorrow night. And I'll work with you on it, or you can work with it. And if you run into any sticking points, you could come in, and I can straighten you out then. Do that. 
Thank you. All right. And that goes for everybody, whoever's out there. I mean, I'll be here tomorrow night for two hours. All right. So here's a, let's do the next one. This one is kind of fun. This is a very unusual one. So, okay. So you say to yourself, gee, that's awful hard, you know? That's awful hard, Bill, to, to, to you know, figure out how to do this 30 degree thing. That's, that's awful rough. Isn't there an easier way to do this? Well, you know what? There is. Let's go to the view menu. Let's go to guides. Let's go to show guides, okay? Bring the guides back on. Now, this time, we're going to try something a little different. This is really cool, too. You ever see the polygon tool? You know that there's a, a rectangle tool in here. There's a rounded rectangle tool in here. There's an ellipse tool in here. There's a polygon, a star tool, and a flare tool. Well, the polygon tool is the tool that I'm going to pick. And what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to double-click it uh, out here. There we go. Double-click it. Now, what I can do is I can set radius, but I can also set size. Sides. I'm sorry, not size. Sides. Remember, we need six of these things. I'm sorry, 12. We need 12 of these things. So right now it's set to six. If I hit OK, I get that. See that? That's what I get with six. All right? But if I want to, I can come in here and click on it, and I can set it to be 12 and hit OK. And now I have 12. So what I can now do is I can bring this over here. Sit it. I'm going to sit it right in the middle of my intersection again. I'm going to remove the fill on it. I'll make it just basic black and white so that you can see this better. And I'm going to now increase the size of the thing, holding the Shift key and the Alt key. I'm going to bring this thing up to a size that's a little more manageable, like about like that. OK, now check this out. I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I got 12 segments. So I have everything I need to make my 12 segments. The only thing I need to do is I need to start drawing my intersection points. And I don't even have to worry about the center on this anymore because I got these, ang these points right here. And if I use logic, I can get my, my line segment tool and I can click and place a point right above that, and I can bring it down to right about there, okay? And I have a line segment. See that? And the line segment is going from point to point correctly. I'm going to move it up just a slight bit. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here. I don't know whether this will work with 30 degrees or not. I think it might. Let's try it and see. If not, I'll, there's another way I can do it. But let's just give it a, a try for the laughs of it. Click on this. Let's go in and there we go. 30 degrees. Let me hit copy. And look at that. It actually did. It hit right where I wanted it to hit. See that? So I'm going to do the same thing again. Copy, 30 degrees. Copy, 30 degrees. Look at that. Isn't that insane? Look at that. And copy. And there you go, guys. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Not even, really, it wasn't even hard, was it? That is a work of beauty. It's incredible. The, 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 thing, the thing is, that, you know, don't be impressed by Bill doing this. Be impressed that the program has the ability to do it. Bill just learned how to do it. You just learned how to do it. What I'm you should be impressed when I can do it. <laughs> you, listen, it, just keep in mind the simple things. You have to have some guides. You have to place the object centered on the guides so that the center point is right on the guides. It either has to be a circle or you can come in and you can choose the, um, the polygon and set it to six sides. And all you need to do is you need to establish one rule, one line that hits the right point here and here. There is basically just opposite polar ends of the points. Make sure they're hit, hitting in the right place. And then all you're going to do is use the rotate tool to set an angle of 30 degrees and copy it. It's simple. Look, it's only set to 30 degrees. The object is selected, 30 degrees, and hit copy. And it will automatically leave the original alone and make you a new one at the angle of 30 degrees. It couldn't be simpler. All you have to do is know the number, 30 degrees. 
right and you just want to start your line just about an eighth of an inch outside that yeah you know why you want to do that because it's it, it's going to end up clipping it away anyway you want to make sure that it's outside and then the reason that it, it, it's outside is so that you're you're guaranteed you get a clean cut this thing will cut cleanly okay gotcha. all right all right so now the same thing applies here what you're going to do is you're going to come in here and you're going to click on this and you're going to come over and you're going to grab the let's go let's try it with the scale tool let's do something a little different and we're going to do this uniform and let's scale it down to uh let's see 50 percent let's see what that looks like let's hit preview uh yeah i think that's pretty good hit copy right see how it, you see how it brought it back how it brought the original in there oh okay yeah okay but if you hit copy what it's going to do is it's going to copy it and it's going to send the original back out. See? And now you've actually copied it. This is a great program. It really, you know what it really comes down to? It just comes down to you having a little bit of control over the program. That's what it is. And one of the reasons that you're here is this is a course on, on um, color and production, but keep in mind it is also uh, a course on learning these programs and what these programs can do and I have a certain amount of time to work with you and I want to show you how to do these things sure. so that's really what this is all about is getting you to know a little bit more about this program it's it, as far as a production tool you guys are going to be graphic designers you will be using Illustrator you will be using Adobe Photoshop you will be using Adobe InDesign and if you listen to me you'll use them correctly and you will you'll impress the people that you work for because you will be doing the right thing with the right program and you will know when to use a program and why that's what it really comes down to so once again with the regular selection tool I'm just gonna come over here and I'm gonna make sure I get everything by marquee it come in and marquee it right remember click hold and drag until you touch everything you know it, it, you have to drag over the whole thing all you have to do is make sure that everything that you want included in the selection has been touched, and then you let go, and it all highlights. Is that just another uh, term for the selection tool? No. No, the selection tool is what you're using. The marquee is the technique. Oh, gotcha. Marquee okay. is the tech. They call it that they just call They had to call it something, so they call it a marquee, marquee selection. It's basically just dragging over all the component elements that you want to select. Gotcha. Okay? If I wanted to select everything on the page, I'd marquee everything on the page. Okay. Gotcha. I, I want to marquee just this area here. I want to I'll grab that area right there. Now, in doing that, if, I, if I'm not careful, you see... See how I didn't get all the mark? I didn't get all the elements in the marquee. Right. Okay. So you got to make sure when you do it, you're you're touching everything that you want selected. You do that, and then what you're going to do is go to the window menu. I guess I put it away. I closed it. Window Pathfinder, and once again, I mean these these shape modes are great. You also have the Shape Builder tool over here. Um, I find. In, in explaining to newbies, people like yourself, who have, have you ever done any of this that I've shown you? Never. Anybody? I have. Oh, Jason, you have? I've used the Pathfinder tool. Okay. All right. Uh, but when you're working with people that might not have, I like to go in and I like to show them the panels because the panels have all the different elements and you can also get similar things happening with the Shape Builder tool, but I'll let you guys deal with that in a more advanced class. It's, it's not terribly more advanced, but this is easier and I think it's a lot easier for people to comprehend who haven't done this before. Okay, so what you're looking for is the divide tool. The reason that you want this, for, you want the divide tool, is you want to basically divide everything up, and do that, and that's what you get. And then you're going to deselect it. You're going to come in here, and you're going to select this thing. Um, you might have to go object ungroup first. Yeah, there we go. And now you can come in here, and you can did it ungroup. No, object ungroup. Let's try it again. See if it's ungrouped. Yeah, now it's ungrouped. Now that one here, you're gonna. I'm gonna delete that first, and then I'm gonna select through the center of this, and I'm gonna delete all of that. And there you have what I did right here. 
and then really it's the exact same process where you're just going to use your eyedropper tool to come in here and you're going to start applying your color all right that's all there is to it and it really is not hard to do what I did just so that you know I'll show you in a second um, what I did was you see over here I use I used a um, a color the solid color but you see for instead of using black I, I put a stroke of a gray on it because I thought it looked very nice that way you see how that looks kind of nice with the gray stroke right yeah it looks nice with the gray stroke I, I mean I'm, I'm only telling you the things that I did you know so that's basically it and then you know I just I would basically just continue my process of, of filling in my colors I always like to, to, to finish things that gives you a chance to, you know, really observe what I'm doing and yeah. used to it and ask me any questions. If you need to ask a question at this point, feel free to do so. The only hard part about this is that you have to switch from tools. I mean, there's the shortcut ways that you can switch from tool to tool, but I very seldom use shortcuts because, again, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't like the shortcuts, especially when I'm trying to learn something. It just confuses me more and gives me more to think about. Yeah, this is easier. It is a little bit time consuming, but you know, I always find, it, I always feel this way about it. When you're creating things, when you're working on things, it's a process, and you're sort, and you're thinking through stuff. And if you take, if you, if you rush things, you're also denying yourself the extra time that it takes to think through some things. So while I'm doing this. Is almost mindless what I'm doing. I can I can be thinking about other aspects of what I'll be doing uh, next. You know, so that's essentially why I do this. And again, I I just I think this is kind of a nice way to handle this. It's a little bit different, you know, and both of them are legitimate because again, you've got 12 segments, and you use the basic tool to get them, and then this is basically just a circle. And uh, you use another basic tool to get that. And both of them look great. Go to the view menu, guides, hide guides, and there you have it. Now, what I did here, let me zoom in over here. What I did over here was I basically created uh, a little arrow. I'm not exactly sure. Let me go to the window menu. Let's see if I can remember how I did this. Let's go to stroke. Where are we at here? Stroke. Did I use arrowhead? I did I use arrowhead. Okay, so what I did essentially here was I, I created a stroke, a three-point stroke that went from there to there, which is nothing more than just a line that does that. Okay, hold the shift key down to keep it nice and straight. And then what I did was I came to my arrowheads and I applied arrowheads to it. See what I did? Real easy. You know, you guys know about this? I had no clue. Me well, neither. <laughs> all you have to do, window, about it. stroke, what, what, uh, Jason? I said I didn't know about it. You didn't? Not about using the arrowheads. Okay. All right. So you go to the window menu. Just for your information, uh, in all these programs, I don't care whether you're in Adobe Illustrator. I don't care if you're in Adobe Photoshop. I don't care if you're in InDesign. You could be a Muse. All these programs, Adobe, one good thing about Adobe is they have all the big programs that you're going to be using as a graphic designer. The advantage to that is it's all coming from the same group of people. So they organize the programs in very specific ways and they're all as similar as they could possibly be to one another. For instance, whenever you want any of these panels over here, you're going to find them in the window menu for all the programs. They're all, if you want any of these panels. And then, of course, you just have to realize, well, what is it I'm trying to do with this? You know, I have a line and it's going to be a, um, a three-point line. If I want it to be bigger, I can come in here, I can make it bigger. See, I can make that bigger. It doesn't look real good. Let's see how there now that's six point it also what it does is it also impacts the um, the arrowhead so what you could do is you could come in here and use a smaller arrowhead see that there's a slightly smaller arrowhead all right but you can come in here and you can change the weight and you'll get a, a weight of the arrowhead see? but that's all it is it's just a matter of coming into the stroke panel drawing a line coming into the stroke panel and you could come up here uh, and you could change the weight of the line up here as well. 
You can't, unfortunately, put arrowheads up here. You can't do that. Yeah, I don't think you can. Let me see. Uh, no, I don't think you can. Nope, you can't. You don't have access to it up here. But if you come into the stroke panel, you can also set this to be a dashed line if you want. Okay? I don't know that you want to do that, but in this particular case, all I did was I created a straight line and I used a couple of arrowheads. And then, of course, if you want, you can use the direct selection tool to click on that arrowhead and you can change the, the length of that line. Okay? And I made that line about that length right there. And then I just drag that thing inside of here like this. Okay? I'm going to delete it. And I just wrote, wrote the word complementary over top of it. And the complementary line now uh, is pointing to the complements, which is the red and the green. Now, if I wanted to, I can click on this, and I can rotate it any way that I want to rotate it. That's a complementary color. That's a complementary color. Pair, I should say. You see what I'm saying? You can rotate this any way that you want, and you can show any complementary pair that you want to show by just doing this. Okay? Complementary. All right, so, so basically, go back to the assignment real quick. Assignment one, there we go, color wheel. Um, You're on assignment two. Yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, don't do that to us. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to assignment one. I hit the wrong button, and then it, I tried to hit the second button, but I was not quick enough. Assignment one, color wheel exploration. So let's see what we say here. All right, so yeah, so what you're going to do is, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to create your basic color wheel, which will be view, the artboard and window, uh, which will be basically this guy right here, you know, in one form or another. Either it's going to be something like this or something like this. Oh, and the other thing I might do is I might actually take this guy and I might, oh, here's another thing that, oh, this is, let me, here we go. This is another one that you might find interesting. Let me zoom in on this for a minute. I just It just occurred to me. Uh, here's another thing that you could do. And Actually, let me do it on this one. Cause that, there we go. Let me go on that guy right there. All right, so you have this one here. You understand this one here is, is a complementary color relationship, right? There. Is it on groups? Yes, it is. Okay, so you got a complementary relationship, meaning that essentially that color right there and that color right there represents the colors that you're pointing out in this complementary relationship, right? Those are, the two, those are the focus colors. Those are the colors that you're focusing on. So what you can do if you want is by dragging a marquee around all of those colors. See, I've oh, I don't think I got them all. I, actually, you know what the problem is? I got the wrong tool. I need the regular selection tool. I'm going to drag a marquee over those colors right there. Okay, is this grouped object ungrouped? Yeah, I think it's grouped. All right, now I got it. Let's try mark you around those colors right there. I'm going to hold the shift key down. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to drag a marquee over those colors right there. Okay, so what I did essentially was by marqueeing, I grabbed all of those. I also wanted to grab all of these. So I held down the shift key. The shift key tells the program that I'm not done selecting, and then I went and I did a marquee over here. So everything is selected over here, everything is selected over here, the red, the green, and this stuff in the middle is not selected, right? You got that, everybody? Yeah. No question, yeah. Lola? Right? You're clear? No questions. Okay, go to the window menu and go to transparency. Okay, now watch this. This is cool. Because now what you want to do is you want to focus on the complementary colors, right? So what you can do with the side colors selected, these are all the colors that are not part of the complementary matching pair. What you can do is with the transparency panel open, come over to opacity and use the slider to bring the slider down to say, oh, I don't know, let's try 50% just for the heck of it. If I can get it where I want it to be. 51's close enough. There we go. Look. See that? Now, there's another way 
of presenting your complementary colors. Does that make sense to you what I just did there? Yes. Yes. So really, this all comes down to knowing a few things about this program and how you can present these little graphics. That's really what it is. The more you know about this program and in time, as you go through these courses, instructors like myself are going to show you these things and you will learn, as I learned, all the different things that you can do in this program and by just thinking about all these different things as you're creating these objects, you can then basically come up with really good solutions for these uh, particular exercises. Now this guy here, here's my color wheel. What I did with this would be, now if I wanted to, I could do this. Let's go back for a second. Let's go back to my complimentary. Let me grab that. And let's go copy it. Let's go edit copy. Go back to this guy here. And let's go edit paste in place. There we go. And let me bring this thing up. Bring it up until it's situated right in the middle there. And I'll have to move it over a little bit. There, it's probably good. That'll work. And then if I want, I can scale it up a little bit. There we go. There. Now, what I did here was if I wanted to put my names on the outside of this thing, all right, let me do this. Let me hide this and that 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 and that. that, that and that and let's go object hide selection okay so now I have red here right so I click on red and what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and actually I'm going to rotate this but you see you see how the little rotation let me just show you something here do you see how the little rotation when you click on the rotator see that little bomb site is right there at that little anchor point in front of red there See what I'm talking about? That There's a little blue. See yes. It? What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to get right on top of it. It's a little hard to get on top of. Click on it and drag it down to here. I think I got No, I didn't get it. Control Z. Let me try it again. Click on it. Get it. There we go. See it? You see it? See it's following me? See it's no longer by that little anchor point there? Can you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right, bring it down. I'm going to bring it down. I'm going to situate it right in the middle there, right there in the middle. It's a little hard to get it to go in the middle. There we go. I got it. That's close enough. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate it. All right, I'm going to rotate it 30 degrees. Let's see, it came right back up. Ugh. All right, let's, let's do this again. Let's fix it. Cancel. It came, it jumped right back up. Sometimes it's a little difficult. Oh, geez, this is little bit of a problem. There we go. Got it. All right. Now, if it gives me that trouble, the other thing I could do is I could just simply hold down the control key. I think it's the control key and drag. Uh, hold on. Uh, yeah, rotate it. It's rotating. Okay, there it is, control Z. So what I'm going to do is, to make this thing work, the easiest way to make this thing work is go edit, copy, edit, paste in place, okay, and then drag that little, like, drag that little um, anchor there to the middle, and then just rotate that guy around to there. See how I did that? Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? Yes. Edit copy. Edit paste in place. That's part of the process. Grab the little anchor. Bring the anchor. Oh, sometimes you don't get it. Got to be very careful to get it. Grab, grab that little, little uh, gun sight, that little sight that they got there. There you go. Bring it right down into the middle. And since it's a duplicate, I'm just going to drag that thing over to here. And I'm just going to continue going around, and after I get it done, I'm just going to change the, the type, change the name of the type. That's basically how I did that. Object, show all. See? That's basically how I did it. Let's go. 
on the show. Well, let me get rid of these two. You get, do you understand basically what I'm what I did there? Yeah, I think so. It's a variation. It's a variation on what I was doing before. I basically start off by setting up one of the words, and it is actually left aligned. If you want, maybe make this a little easier. Click center align, and then place that thing right on the guide. Now notice the difference. Center aligned. If you take a look, I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit on this so you can see it. Center aligned. You see that little anchor point is no longer on the left. Mm -hmm. There it is. It's on the left. If I had center, there it is on the center. Right. Okay. So then you're going to come over here. Let me let me zoom out a bit. View zoom out a bit, and let me scroll this thing up. I don't need this anymore. Let me scroll this thing up a little bit. There we go. That's good enough. Right there. Rotate tool. You get that little bomb site right there. Cl click on it. Carefully click on it. Bring it down. Place it right in the middle. Just place it right in the middle, right there. See it? In the middle there? It's no longer there. It's down the middle. And then all you're going to do is you're going to rotate that thing around. But, of course, I didn't copy it. So it's going to just move around, and it's not copied. But if I have to, I have to copy it first. But you get the general idea how to do that? Yeah. And you just do that, and you place your text all around the outside of this, and then just select it and change the uh, the the name of the copy, you know, the name of the color. Right. That's it. That's all you have to do for that if you want to do that one. And let's go object show all. And eventually what will end up happening is end up with this. There, That's what you'll end up with. You'll end up with something that looks like that. Okay. And then, of course, what you could do with this is you could do, you know, you could do your triadic color. You could have three, three little lines meeting in the middle for the triadic color. Uh, if you're going to do, if you're going to do a quadratic color, I would let me just get this out of the way. What I would do with that is I would come in here, and I would grab my rectangle tool, and I would come over here and I would drag something along the lines of that. See what I'm doing? And then I would uh, basically make that stroke uh, a mi middle gray. I'd try to make a gray similar to the gray that I'm using. I may not get exactly. I'm going to switch it. There you go. There, you see that? There's your, okay. there's your four. All right. And if you want a, a triangular one, let me delete this guy. Actually, you know what? Let me see if I could, how I would do this. Um, Oh, I, you know what? I know how to do it. I know how to do it. This is cool. This, you'll like this. I think you'll appreciate this. You know the pen tool, right? There's your pen tool. Check this out. So now you got this rectangle here, right? And you can see my little anchor points. See? You see what I'm po talking about, these little anchor points there in the corner? Yeah. Yes. So what, what you want to do is you want to turn this thing just the way it is. You want to turn it into a triangle. The way to do that is you have different tools here. You've got the pen tool, which you can use to draw with. You have the add anchor point tool, which you can add anchor points to shapes with. So if I click on the add anchor point tool, oh, and by the way, just so that you know, the tools nest. And anywhere that you see that little triangle at the corner there, all you have to do is click hold and this will pop up and you can see the tools that are in there. And if you come over here and click on this, you can bring it out and now you have access to all the tools and, and you can work with them. So I'm going to grab the add anchor point tool and I'm going to come over here and right on that guideline, I'm going to click to place a point. So now I've added a point right there on that line. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. You know, I can, you know I've added a point because two things are happening. That one is blue, and notice that all these points here are no longer blue, but they're little white open ones. That's mm -hmm. telling me that I did it right. So now I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to grab the delete anchor point tool, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to click on that point, and I'm going to delete that point. And then I'm going to click on that point, and I'm going to delete that point. And look at that. I got a triangle for my tetradic color. And if I want to, I can just select the shape, and I can move the shape down. Whoops, I think I got the wrong thing selected. 
Yeah, I did. I got the wrong thing select. Let me see if I can get this. There we go. Bring it down just a touch like that. And there you have tetradic color, orange, red, red, violet, and green. So you see how easy all this is? And then, of course, if you want, you can just bring your complementary in here. I'm, I'm just trying to give you some ideas, and you can t change it to tetradic. I don't even know that I can spell this. T-E-T-R-A-T-I-C, tetradic. I don't think that's probably right. I don't know. I'm not much of a speller, by the way. There you go. Look at that. I'll go to the view menu, guides, hide guides, and there you have it. See what I mean? Yep. So I mean I'm just I'm just at this point showing you these things and I'm hoping that you'll learn a little bit and you'll try some of this stuff and maybe be a little bit creative with it. All right, so that's that and um, that gets me to the last thing that we have to worry about and that is our assessment. So here's what I did. Uh, go back to what I was saying to you before. You can see I have four artboards here. And if you, if you, I don't know, for any of you that are not familiar with the artboard panel, there's your artboard panel right there. And you can click on the artboard panel, to open up the artboard panel, and, you know, you can see that I have four different artboards. My first one is the hex sign. I call it the hex sign. One is analogous, one is complementary, and one is te uh, tertiary. So what I basically did was using the same mechanism that I worked with on the front. Let me go to my hex sign first. There's my hex sign first. Now the hex sign, uh, let me go back to explain to you what uh, I was referring to when I was talking about these hex signs. What you're looking at here is, that's called a heart and flowers design. That's, that's what that design is known as. It's known as, it's a, it's a classic uh, Pennsylvania Dutch hex sign. They put these on barns and on buildings for good luck. They've been doing it forever. And this particular design is the hearts and flowers. That's really what it is. And if you take a look at the colors, the colors are the traditional red, yellow, and blue. If you were to see these on the side of barns, they are generally that, that kind of a color. So this looks pretty much exactly like what the... Uh, hex sign on the side of a barn would look like. But I thought since some of these colors were like a different color schemes, I thought what I would do is I would play around with them. Now look, this is an analogous color scheme. So this is now set to these three colors right here, which is red, yellow, and blue. Red, yellow, and blue. Okay? But what I could do is I could come in here and I could modify this design. So what I would do basically is I'd come in here and I would hold down the shift key and I would click that blue and that blue, that blue, and that blue. And then I would come over here and get my eyedropper tool and I'd click the purple. And so you see what I did was I modified my design and now I'm going to, this one here is red and so red is fine. I'll leave the red alone. Now the orange is, um, is just really modifying the yellow. So I hold down the shift key, select that object, that object, that object, that object. And then I come over here and click on the orange. And what I've done basically here is I've taken an analogous color scheme and I've applied it to my design. You see what I'm doing? That is really cool. Yeah. yeah. Now, the other thing is this is just basically here as a kind of a reminder of what the original design looked like, which would be right there. See? Mm -hmm. So I, I've set this up so that you really get a good idea what I'm talking about. But, I mean, I, I'm, and I, I, this was just the way I interpreted this. I, I thought to myself, well, what could I do? What would be interesting? And for some reason, it popped into my mind, these uh, hex signs. So I, I went online. I looked them up. I have to go. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. You, you basically can watch the end of the video. Are you good so far with what we have to do? Yeah, so far. Okay. okay. Good luck then. Now here's the complementary, all right? Now this one's a little more difficult, and the reason it's more difficult is because there's only two colors here. So what I would have to do with this one is I would have to uh, use an HSB, hue, saturation, or brightness. So what I would do with this one here, if I was going to do this, is I would select my red and my green. Now I got red and blue and yellow. So what I would do is I'd select the yellow and the yellow and the yellow, and the yellow, 
okay? And then I would apply a green to that, okay? Oops, control Z. I, I grabbed the wrong tool. I forgot to grab the right tool. Oops, let me get back. I made a little bit of an error. Let me click on these again. Got to get the eyedropper tool and click and make them green. Okay, so I got that far with it. So now what I want to do is I got, I got a third color here. And so what I would maybe do with this is click on this. Uh, you know, yeah, the blue. Because the red is fine and now the green. Click on the blue, the blue, the blue, and the blue. And then maybe what I would do is I would choose red. And then what I would do is I'd come in here and double click on this. And I'd hold down the shift key. And I would drag this across here until it's a much lighter red and click on that and even though it is a complementary okay even though it is a complementary it I've utilized a my HSB my saturation um, my saturation and I've used that secondary color it is still those two colors but I've incorporated a, a desaturated version of that color does that make sense to you what I did? Yes. And on, yes. on the, the on this assessment, do we okay, do we have to have the color wheel on it also? I did re, I did this for I did this for show. Okay. I did this I did this whole thing for show. The reason I did this, see, I'm the instructor and I gotta try to make this make right. sense. Right. I thought by having the, 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 the color wheel showing what the color arrangement is. All right, now here's the other thing that we could do. Notice this says complementary and split complementary, right? Right. Okay, so let's, let's try this another way. Let's go file revert. Let's revert this back to everything. Okay, so let's go back, ignore. All right, let me go over to split complementary. Uh, right there. Okay, so let's do this. This is click, let's click on that and let me go to transparency. Hold on. Let's go to window. Let's go to transparency for a second. And oh, wrong button. Huh. Window transparency. There we go. So it's 50%. All right. So let's do this. Let's bring this back up to 100%. And let's click on that one. And let's bring that up to 100%. Okay. And let's take this one and let's bring that one down to 50%. Now, why did I do that? 50%. Oh, don't worry about 50. 49 is good. Okay, so up oh, wrong one. Oh, jeez. Hold on. Good Lord. There, let's get the right one. There we go. And let's bring that one down to 50%. 50. Uh, 50. Oh, God. 50 is a sticky one. You know what? There we go. That's good enough. Okay, so why did I do that? Because this now represents a split complementary. So do you understand what a, what a split yeah. complementary means? I do, I do. It just clicked. Okay, so what you're basically doing here is you're de you're basically you have the complementary color scheme. The, the red, green is your normal complementary colors. So what you're doing with a complementary split is you're taking either the red and splitting this way, or you're taking the green and splitting that way. That way. That's all there is to it. It's really very simple. And, and these are things that, you know, are based to what, basic to what we're going to So, again, all you would now do is come in here. You don't need the red anymore. So you're going to click on all the reds. Okay. And then you're going to come over here, and you're going to choose one of the colors. Okay? And this is beautiful because you end up with three colors. Click on yeah. this guy here. Or I'm sorry. Click on the yellow. It's hard to talk and keep your focus on what you're doing. Click on that. There we go. And then come over here and the blue. And all I'm doing really is replacing color. I'm just replacing yeah, color. Okay. It actually becomes very simple once you plan in your mind what it is you're trying to accomplish. So there you go. That's it. Now I, I might have one more over here. I don't know what that one is. Okay, this is tertiary color. This is very simple. What this is, there's a, there's a primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. All, and if you go in, let's go back to this for a minute. Uh, let's go to announcements. Because this is fun and interesting. Let's go down to uh, Adobe Color. And let's find tertiary color. Nope, that's not what I want. I don't want Adobe Color. I want the other one. Help. That's it right there. All right, let's go to 
color schemes. There we go. Okay, color wheel. Let's go to tertiary. Bingo, right there. So where? We, let's let's see what it says here. There are six tertiary colors. They're created by mixing primary and secondary colors together. So see how they're basically doing this is they are mixing different variations of colors. So you have secondary colors, which are green, orange, and purple. They're created by mixing two of the pri just two of the primary colors. The six tertiary colors are, creating, are created by mixing primary and secondary colors. So that's really what this whole thing is all about. So again, I, I, that's why these links are there because when you get a chance, go in and take a look at all this stuff and you really get a pretty good se sense of what the whole game plan for this is. And again, this is the really beginning of the week kind of stuff. This is not the heavier lifting stuff. But I mean, this is fun. I mean, I, at least I find this fun and I know all about it. So it's still fun for me. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to apply my colors to this just as I would apply them any other and that would be the orange the green that's fine and then of course the purple for the red let's just replace them real quick and let's go to purple boom and there you have it okay and you can see that you know these hex signs look marvelous but they generally if you look at these things I think I actually undid all of them so I don't know what we're going to see when we go fit all in window yeah, I got a couple of them that you're seeing here. Mm -hmm. Only one I'm not seeing is the analogous because I removed it. Right. But this is what the real hex sign looks like. But using these color examples, you can take, and again, the reason I chose this is because it, it to me, was just like perfect. It was primary colors. There was three of them. The majority of these things involved at least three colors. Um, and... I thought, what a great way, what a nice way to, to really illustrate how to work with these colors. Exactly. Do you have to do it this way? No. I, I'm looking for you to think creatively. Think okay. about it and think about what kind of an object you might find that would be interesting to do this with. And, and don't be representational. You, if you want to create something completely on your own, that's perfectly fine. The, the important thing, though, is that you end up with four of these guys so that you can submit it. Now, what you're going to do after you get this done, let's say that this thing is all done, all you're going to do, it's really very simple, all you're going to do is you're going to come up here and you're going to go export, I think, uh, no, actually just in this case it's save as or save as copy. And you're going to change the formatting uh, to Adobe PDF. Okay. It's in color and production, so I'm going to put it right out here so we can see it in a minute. And it's use artboards all. See that? You oh, don't yeah. have to do anything. Yeah. You, you, you could go with a range. But there's no point in that. Just you're 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 going to do them all. I'm just pointing this out to you so that you know that when you and you know how to create artboards, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're really creating all the artboards into this PDF. You hit save. The PDF comes up. Uh, for our purposes right now, there are different settings in here. We'll talk about more. We'll talk about this more in the course. But right now, Illustrator default is just fine. One of the things that I recommend that you understand very much about this, and again, I'm going to point it out now. We'll talk about it again. There are options in here. You don't need to embed the page thumbnails because the actual images are there anyway. Okay. Uh, create Acrobat layers from top level layers. We, we don't have more than one layer in here, so you don't really need that, but you can just leave that alone. It doesn't hurt anything. Okay. The one big option in here that I think is important is the preserve illustrator editing capabilities. Now, why is that important? It's important for two reasons. Number one, do you want that to be sent to me in such a way that I can open it up in Illustrator and look at the elements that were created? Or do you want it to be sent to me as a flattened piece of art that I am no longer able to get access to the elements of? Does that yeah. make sense how I'm explaining it? Yeah, you're yeah. explaining it very well. Yeah, so if, if I, de if I yeah. deselect this... If I right. deselect this, what's going to happen is it's going to essentially turn it into a JPEG. 
It's going to turn it into a flattened piece of art, a bitmap, and it's going to be sent to me, and I'm not going to be able to click on those elements and look at them. Now, that's not a bad thing if you're sending it to somebody that you don't want to have access to that work. Right. Okay? But keep in mind that if you do that, if you deselect this and send it to me, it's very possible, and let me hit, let me hit uh, preserve editing. Let me, let me just do one more thing, and then I'll go back to this. View PDF after saving. If you click that, what it's going to do is it's going to open this thing up as a PDF so that you can see what it looks like, and I'm going to do that so that you can see it. Okay. All right, so let me do that, let me do that first, okay? And it'll open up, and there's my PDF, and look, come on, open, where are my pages? There. There are my four pages. See them? Yep. There they are. That's exactly what you'll be sending me. And I can just come over here and I can go page two. It mine's for some reason my computer is acting a little slow tonight. I don't know why it's doing this. There you go. See? And you can just go through all of them and take a look at them. Yeah, it's acting acting very funny. Yeah, right. mine here. It's a weather. Yeah, let me get rid of that. Anyway, you get the general idea. The other thing I want to point out is this. Let me go back. And let me go to save the copy again. And let's go back to save it as a PDF and hit save. Okay, so here's the deal. If I remove this, and if you save it, okay, if you save that, it's going to flatten this thing and make it into a single piece of art. Okay? So let's go save PDF. Let's see if we can, I don't want to view it. Let me just call this thing save PDF. Saving this document with preserve Illustrator editing capabilities unchecked may disable some editing features when the document is read back in. Do you want to continue? Yeah, okay. And it did it, okay? So now I have that thing saved. I don't exactly know where I saved it, though. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, is it in here? Hex symbol copy. I don't know whether that's it or not. Let me open it up in Illustrator. Put file open. Let's see. Let's go to hex symbol copy open. There. Okay. 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 So there. Now watch. You see how that's a bitmap? Oh yeah. Okay. But there's a problem. You see, it wants to be an. It wants to be. It wants to be a vector piece of art. You see the line? Right. But it's not allowing me to do. See it. See the line? Yep. Yeah. It's not allowing me to do that because I saved it a certain way. But if I mess around with this, if I go to the object, expand, let's see what happens. Okay, nothing happened that way. But I can do this. I can go into here and I can go to object. I can go to image trace. Oh, you know what? It's not even going to let me do that. Object, image trace, make. See, it won't even let me do that. So you see? Yeah, you can't see anything, right? Hey, hold on, object, image, trace. Yeah, see, it's not going to let me do that either. So actually, it does a pretty good job of protecting this piece of art. It really does. Consider yeah, it. so it really comes down to knowing this and being aware that if you want to send it to somebody and you don't want them to have access to it, you can send it that way. If you don't mind or if you want them to have access to it, make sure that that um, editable um, checkbox is checked. It, it usually is checked by default. So basically, right. now I don't know, let's see, so uh, since I've deselected that, let's go file, save a copy, and let's see what it comes up as. It comes up as, see, now since I asked for that preserve editing capabilities to be uh -huh. off, you see what it did? Yeah, unchecked it. Exactly. So now if I check this thing back on, it thinks that's what I'm going to want. I hit yeah. save PDF. Yeah. Now if I go to do it again, you'll see it should be on again. See? Right. So it has a memory. Okay. Okay. Right. So when we, when, like when we have to save our dis, uh, assignments, assignments, uh, DDS 114, we want to do save as, correct? Save or save as, and you're going to save it as a PDF. And for me, uh, since I'm the instructor, I would just leave the, um, I would leave it checked, edit capabilities. 
I, right. so, so I can open it up in Photoshop. Absolutely. I don't always open everything you send me up in Photoshop. Occasionally, I want to look at something that you did. I'm sort of either baffled by it or I'm a little bit in question of what's going on and I want to have a closer look. I'll open it up in Illustrator. Usually, when the work comes in, I see what I want to see from the PDF with, when I just open it up in Acrobat okay. Reader. Okay. Okay, yeah, that, that cleared a lot up. Any questions? Any final questions? Are we all good? All good. All right. So you know that um, you know that um, tomorrow, J uh, Jason. Are you good? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> no question. No final questions. None from me. Okay. I will be here tomorrow night between seven and nine o'clock, and. You know, feel free to come in. I'll try to get this video up uh, and in tonight. If not, it'll be in early tomorrow morning. Great. Okay. Great. So uh, I'm going to come in first of all. Let me go up here and let me stop the recording.